I was going through a rough time in my life mm-hmm. uh, from things that law enforcement officers have to deal with a lot of yeah. crap, and they don't teach you how to deal with it. Yeah. And then uh, also my district partner, you know, someone that worked with me and G was killed in the line of duty and stuff. And I took that really hard. You know, mm-hmm. I, I took a lot of guilt for that. And I was still recovering from all that. Yeah. And I had just gone, basically gone through a divorce at the same time mm-hmm. all that happened. So I didn't want to date or right. anything. You know, I didn't really know anyone here. And like I said at dinner, like I didn't want to hang out with law enforcement. I, like, yeah. I was I was getting over it. So I was like, all right, so I get online, and that's how how we met. Like I told you earlier, the classic love story. Yeah. <laughs> online. Online, online dating. dating. The, new, the new norm of a classic yeah. dating story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was that. funny, like, if you listen to her side of the story of our first date, you'd be surprised that we had a second one. Tell us a little bit it about it. It was so nerve-wracking. We, well, I asked him out to dinner, and we met at BJ's. He was mm-hmm. coming back from Dallas. Dallas. And... I'm a rambler. Okay. And he was just like straight face, like so serious and just stoic, I guess, and Mm -hmm. cop face, he said. Okay. That's what he said. I wasn't getting anything out of him. He wasn't talking. You know, like being being law enforcement, (laughs) especially if you're in a situation where you're uncomfortable and stuff, at least least for me Mm -hmm. and stuff, like, you know, you do the whole, I was sitting down, but if I was standing up, I probably would have laded myself, crossed my arms and just Mm -hmm. listened blank face and apparently that's basically what i did oh, i got a visual of that so i thought i was being a great listener wow no, but I apparently was i was being an ass and rambling <laughs> omg so, do you remember what you were rambling about i don't any i don't know horses <laughs> horses, horses. horses. <laughs> he remembers job. Horses. i don't know <laughs> but then it was funny because after our first date you know i was new to the dating scene mm-hmm. and dating i don't know how long so I didn't know like the protocol on when you're supposed to call back or whatever. But then five minutes, I texted her like, "Hey, I had a great time. I want to do it again." <gasps> Love I that. Known if he was interested if I didn't get that text. Yeah. <laughs> wow, it was awful. Did you have an idea that she wanted a second day, or you kind of throw yourself out there? I just kind of threw myself out there because mm-hmm. even though it looked like I was, you know, blank face and all that stuff, I felt comfortable. Right. Mm-hmm. It was the first time I had felt comfortable wow she's like not for me yeah she she did not because you know because being in law enforcement like especially in like the deep part of my career in law enforcement i got a point i did not want to hang out with civilians because they always have their their cop story you know Mm. oh i got pulled over and this cop is such a dear she's like well you're probably being a fucking bitch yep you know i just got tired of it yeah and stuff i understand that um when i was in skeet and i was dating I remember if I would tell someone I was a cop and a female, it was like 50% if they're like, okay, cool, or, oh, you're a fucking ass. Damn. So I just got tired of it. So if you are if you weren't law enforcement or military, mm-hmm. I wasn't going to talk to you. Did that yeah. make you feel like more isolated? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You feel completely isolated. Because, I mean, there was times, like, I would just go out and, like, I'd get my, my car washed. Mm-hmm. or whatever and I I remember one time I saw a guy that I took to jail we had a fight and I ended up taking him to jail and then he saw me at the car wash and he's like oh you ain't got your shit now and you know it's gonna <gasps> and I just I pull my gun out I was like I'm ready and then everyone's looking around he walks around and I pull my badge out it's okay guys I'm cut I'll put my Damn. gun back up and sit down uh, that is so annoying and like I, like I'm just envisioning me like if that happened to me, like, if I were you, like, I would just be so, like, edged up all the time. Just yeah, waiting for that to and happen mm-hmm. again and again and again. And I'm sure we'll get into a little bit deeper about uh, some of the more stuff I went through and uh, some of the science behind it. But I was at an equine therapy place, was it about three weeks ago? It's called Our Watch. O-U-R. O-U-R? Our Watch. Oh, Our Watch. Okay. Uh, and they were going, kind of going over the science of it and not going to be able to only part you're going to be able to hopefully be on the video part, but it'd be easier if I have a piece of paper. But she was kind of explaining, like, normal persons like this, you know, when they come up, they go down, they come up, they go down. And there's a baseline. Yeah, then there's a baseline, and it's really to. close to it mm-hmm. at all times. Well, police officers, they're up here. 
And when they go up there, because they're at work, getting ready for work, you know, because you get trying to get yeah. mental game for work, because, you know, man, all right, I might get into a gunfight tonight or something like that. So you're always up here what when you're up. up when going, yep. And you'll go just as far down. Mm. And it takes, she said, at least 48 hours for you to go back to baseline. Well, within 48 hours, you're back at work. Damn, yeah. So you're never hitting that baseline. So what is these lines? Would, would that indicate like stress or like yeah, emotional? Yeah, like stress levels coming up and then you, you drop. Mm. You go up and you and drop. And the drop it's a roller. would be when you come home and you just zone out. You yeah. don't want to talk to your significant other or you just push them away or whatever it might mm. be. It's just, it's an extreme low. Mm -hmm. And then to get back to feeling good or whatever, it's work ramping up. <coughs> yeah. You go back here because when you come home or when whenever you're just low mm. yeah, almost like a depressed kind of state yeah, it really you is know, especially yeah. you know like my first police department i went it was like a 10-hour shift i'd get like 30 calls for service i mean i'm constantly go 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 Damn. go go and stuff and i got to the point i loved it up here to where i started doing extra jobs over time everything i was working 80 90 hours a week holy crap you know just so i didn't have to be down Hit when I was low. down and you know, I was married at the time and that would just that would cause issues because mm -hmm. I'm like like hey we need to do this I'm like just leave me alone like I want to zone out yeah. yeah or some people go and drink yeah to some people go and get know. rid of that yeah when we met I was actually at a pretty low point in my life mm -hmm. and stuff so she never saw it because you know when you're dating someone new it's all fun and exciting so you're always right. happy and happy and happy and stuff but uh like after we had been dating for a while and I was a contractor and I was home for my, my 30 days, she'd be at work and I was still at my low and she didn't notice it. I was spending two to three hundred dollars a day at the bar. OMG. Like I, she never knew it. Yeah. Insane. She's like, oh, what? You seriously could have bought me a saddle. Yeah. <laughs> Literally. You make me sound like a gold digger. I swear. I wanted free coffee. I could have had a saddle. <laughs> <laughs> but they're all facts, though. Yeah. They're hey. all facts, though. Okay. Ideally, after you, we finish this episode, you're going to feel so much better about bringing everything out to the light. But you're digging yourself a hole. <laughs> <laughs> we've already discussed all this. We've, all, we've always l laughed at it and all that, so. If yeah. I knew I was going to get in trouble, I'd probably be saying it. <laughs> okay. I like where I live. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Interesting, interesting. One thing that I wanted to ask you, when you were spending $300 a day at the bar, what were you trying to calm? What were you trying to get rid of? What were you trying to silence at that time? Uh, well, like when I was deployed, I was busy, and I was away from the real world. So I wasn't, nothing really bothered me when I got there. When I came back here, the reality hit. And, um, you know, when you're, when you're in law enforcement, you see a lot of bad crap. You know, I've had kids die in my arms. Mm -hmm. I, I see abused spouses, you know, all sorts of bad stuff. And you just have to learn how to deal with it. And they don't, at least back then, they didn't tell you how you can deal with it and stuff. And then, so I already had my demons from that. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, on June 12th, 2016, uh, that's when my district partner was killed and he was a rookie. Yeah. I think I don't, I don't even think he had been on the streets for six months. Mm -hmm. Are you own. serious? And the reason why I felt really guilty about it is uh, when he got moved to, to our shift and he got moved to my district, the, the Sarge and the Lieutenant came up to me and said, like, Hey man, you're one of the veteran officers here. You need to take, take him under your wing, watch out for him. So I felt a responsibility for him. So I'd for show sure. to, you know, some of his calls and some of his traffic stops, just make sure he's good. And for stuff. Sure. And then I, I would give him, you know, my two cents on how I would handle a situation. Well, that night that he was killed, we had already ran out to a house for just a noise complaint. There was a party. And we told him, you know, they're being kind of kind of douches to us. And I was like, hey, come back out here. She's going to start writing tickets to everybody. Mm -hmm. And then we went about our way. And then we got called back out there again. And I showed up and another officer was there. And I was like, typically this would be a call that I would handle by myself. Mm -hmm. you know. But I'm like, you know what? He needs some experience. So I wanted him to come out too. So I didn't disregard him at all. Mm -hmm. And we're waiting for him. And then we're like, okay, let's take a little, let's start walking up. And he'll show up, you know, probably about a minute or so. He can't be that far away. 
then that's when the radio clicked, said, hey, there's a, we're getting reports of an accident involving mm -hmm. a police officer at this intersection. And I was like, oh, shit. Oh, so shit. So we run to our cars, and uh, it was funny. Not funny, but I was the last car, police car to leave that area. But I was the first one to show up. Damn. Like, I remember cussing out the officers that were in front of me because they weren't driving fast enough for me. Are you serious? I knew who it was. We all knew who it was. And so I was able to pass them. And I want to say I was the first. It's hard to remember some of the details. Yeah. But I, I remember uh, once I was one of the first ones there. Mm -hmm. And I was the first one to him. And I remember I reached in and I tried to check his pulse. I thought I felt a pulse. Mm -hmm. But I was so amped up. Right. It was my pulse. I was feeling through Damn. my fingers. So I, you know, I had to recollect myself, all that, reach back in. Checked for a pulse. There wasn't one. And then you can just tell by the way he looked mm -hmm. that the impact killed him immediately. Oh, that is so crazy to the me. The good thing about it, like, I don't think he had to suffer because it honestly looked like the impact took his life right then and there mm -hmm. and stuff. So I knew he was gone, and everyone's trying to get him out, but I already knew. Mm -hmm. I, just, I just stepped back for a little bit, and I'm like, I was like, what the fuck did I just do? I should have disregarded him. Like, right, right. there, the guilt kicked in. Wow. Like, you immediately put the blame yeah. on yourself. 100%. And I was like, what the fuck? Yeah. You know, it, was, it was hard. And I went and sat down on the curb. And I got up. You know, I tried to help open the door and all that. Mm -hmm. You know, the fire department. Like, I'm not a big fan of firefighters. <laughs> you know, they just like to cook all day and sleep. <laughs> but... We the love y'all. Showed up. <laughs> the guys that showed up, they understood the situation. Yeah. And they they let us take control of get him out of the vehicle mm -hmm. and stuff. They weren't you know trying to push us out of the way. They knew we were amped up, we we're emotional, so they're there to help us rather than right. going out of the way. We got this. Right. So I mean, kudos for them. You yeah. Know, I really did appreciate that. But then you know, lifelike came in. And the thing that really messed me up after that, you know, I went and said my goodbye to him in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And after I did that, someone said, hey, we need someone to go sit with the uh, the person that just killed him. And they looked at me. I was like, all right. Probably so not a good idea. The, so so what do you mean the person that he was involved in the car accident mm -hmm. with? The one that, that And he survived? She yeah, was a female. She, she, she survived? survived? She survived. So I went to where she was at. I never heard that part. <gasps> so okay, so what does she do? Run a red light? Or? Yeah, she Can we DWI. Yeah. She's okay. already been sentenced. Okay. And all that. I think she got something like 30-something years. Okay. Golly. So she's already been sentenced and all that. But from what I understand, she was high on narcotics. Wow. And alcohol. Wow. And I think he was trying to make, a, make the turn or something and got struck. Dang. Mm -hmm. So just immediately, boom. Mm -hmm. And I think, I don't think much really happened to her. I think she had like a broken leg or something. Yeah, usually that's what happens when people that are intoxicated and they get in trouble. That's yeah. gnarly. So you had to go sit with her. Yeah. Well, the doctors were in there, you know, they're working on her and stuff, but I had a, she's in our custody. Right. At that point. So I drew the short straw on having to go hang out with her, which the entire time. Why did time, anyone have to hang out with her? Because she's in custody. So, so like when, she, when someone's in custody, even if they're in the hospital, somebody has to be there. Gotcha. Either the police department that arrested them or sometimes the county will send someone or if the hospital has their own police department, someone okay. will have them go there. But so no one volunteered one to do gotcha. that job for you? No one volunteered? Uh, I think there was so much chaos going on. No one really realized it was me that went. And what really messed me up was... That night, before all that happened, was the first night him and I got to take lunch together. Dang. Wow. And so we were at the restaurant, and we even cleared it, and we got to know each other. Yeah. And, you know, that was the first night we actually got to sit down, talk, and know each other. Mm -hmm. Wow, and this and seems then, like just instantly. And then like four hours later, he was gone. Wow. That is nuts. Where so, were you during all of this? Because... Obviously, it's very emotional for you too. Yeah, I was on the west side of town. Okay. And all I, I don't, I don't remember the dis the call being okay. dispatched, and I just remember 
we're getting a call about a, an officer that's been involved in a crash and he's not responding. And I felt like helpless because I'm like all the way over here mm-hmm. and we're, it's literally 15 miles, 18 yeah, miles. Yeah, it was literally on the other side of town. So I felt pretty helpless. And I remember me and some of the guys on the west side, once we heard what happened, we were at the park and we were just kind of like, kind of like the way you see us now, it's exactly the same way. Mm-hmm. Like literally. I was like, fuck, man, what happened? Blah, blah, blah. Like, what, what's going on? Like, mm-hmm. what, what's the deal? You know? And it's, yeah, it's just, it, it's, I'm, I'm kind of like reliving, like, I'm picturing myself where I was at when that happened. It's just, it's just nuts to me. But, so that's the, that was the main thing that you were trying to silence is that guilt. Yeah. Uh, that, and because that, that was the straw that broke the camel's back for me. So there was other stuff. There's other on. stuff, you know, just from law enforcement in general, having mm-hmm. to deal with all the time. And mm-hmm. then I was uh, I was married at the time, and actually we are going through a divorce. But uh, that the same week was that happened was the same week our marriage was over. So you already were going through a divorce, and then mm-hmm. that happened? Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. So that all happened all at once. And wow. that was just the straw that broke the camel's back. And I remember I was in a fight. Uh, just a verbal fight with my ex at the time. And I was just done. I hadn't slept in like three or four days. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I tried drinking just to help me fall asleep. And I remember one time I came to work and Sarge was like, you haven't slept, go home. He didn't even, he didn't charge me any days off or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I commend him for that. You know, he did take care of Mm -hmm. me in that aspect. Uh, he's like, you need to go home, get some sleep. You're, you're not working tonight. Yeah. And, uh, so I, I, you know, I went home, we got, I got into a fight, uh, an argument with with my ex. I picked up my off-duty weapon, and cops we always keep around in the chamber. At least that's the way I was I was trained. Mm-hmm. Always mm-hmm. have around in in the chamber because sometimes you don't have the time to rack it. Yeah. So I picked. I ran a fight. I just fucking done. Picked it up, put it to my head, click. And then with all the training I've been through, I just slap rack, and I went to do it again. She hit the mm-hmm gun out of my hand and I hopped in the car. So she was in front of you. Mm-hmm. This was, you I was looking inf- straight at her. OMG. This was, must have been a very intense fight. At that time, they got very, very intense. Wow. So, mm-hmm. yeah, and I pulled the trigger. It went click and my gun has never misfired. I've always had a round in the chamber. Like whenever I racked this up, I don't remember if a bullet came out or anything like that to where maybe there wasn't a round in the chamber. Mm -hmm. I honestly don't know, but I know I always kept a round in the chamber. Mm -hmm. And it was a clock. They don't misfire. That's why Mm -hmm. majority of officers carry them. Because they are a reliable gun. Maybe I'll get some kickbacks from Glock now. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, by the way, I attempted suicide with your product. Can you sponsor me? (laughs) (laughs) Only officers can make jokes like that. (laughs) Like, these motherfuckers are crazy. Yeah. <laughs> what are they talking about? He just talking about Kumin Soy. They're talking jokes, talking shit. Wow. So yeah, uh, so that was and that's very that's another reason week. why I really started. Another reason why I drank a lot because when I came back from my deployments, you know, reality struck. Like I, I really try to do this, and then I still had the guilt and everything, and we had just started dating and stuff, and so like I'd wake up. And I would always joke to people. And I was like, yeah, I go to the gym so I can drink. You know, I always make a joke like that. But I literally went to the gym because I knew I had to maintain some type of physical fitness if I'm going to be drinking as much as I did. And I knew I was going to drink. It's not like one of those, like, oh, I really shouldn't. I was like, fuck, I want to drink. Yeah. So I'd go hit the gym in the morning, shower up. And like, literally, the apartment I had, the, the bar was one block away. So how much of this did you see early on? Um, like I said, he was very, it was new. So I think I only saw the happy person in general, Mm -hmm. um, at night. What you tried to swing at me once at night. At least sleep. once, yeah. Like, really yeah, right. not just... It was like, <laughs> shit! Whoa, 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 Internal whoa. affair investigation! <laughs> yeah. God damn it! No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. In my sleep. No, uh, yeah, I, I had night. nightmares and stuff, you know, mm-hmm. from being, like... I mean, there was one time when I was in law enforcement in the Dallas area where every day I got into a big fight. 
you know, I didn't work the, the nicest area mm-hmm. of town. And every day I would get into a fight. And I remember one week, it was like just back to back fight after fight. Damn. And there's times where I fought two people at once. A senior it boy. sounds like though, like when y'all met, like your that was so ingrained in you still that even didn't, while you were sleeping, like it would come out. Yeah, yeah. Like there's the longest time, like um, even like when I was still with my ex, and I'd be sleeping. My son would. I remember one time my son he was maybe like two years old, two or three, and he's he crawled up the foot of the bed to come lay with me, and I felt him hit touch my foot. I woke up swinging. Almost, I came within inches of nailing him in the face. Holy crap. And I ended up hitting the wall. <gasps> so it was stuff like that. Like it was just yeah, ingrained in you. And then what made me really realize that she was perfect for me is whenever I did almost hit her. Or th- did I, I actually hit, you hit you? I think I actually <laughs> did hit her. <laughs> what? I did hit her in my <laughs> sleep. Uh, I went to, uh, you know, I apologized and all that. And I went to get up to go sleep on the couch. Mm-hmm. I was like, I'm sorry, this is going to be a rough night for me. I'm going to go sleep on the couch. She's like, nope, you're staying right here. We'll get this, get through this together. That was the first time when you, so. That was not the first time that I had slept over, you know. No, I'm talking about as far as like, so was that the first, first time her seeing that side of yes, you? Yes, that was the first time she, and she's like, we'll get through this together. And she actually just scooted closer to me. That mm-hmm. way I you know. Right? Any kind this of combat, like I'd watch a little bit of boxing. Are. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I got you. Yeah, so you just, Cut that yeah, distance yeah. off. I got you. Yeah. So she just get it closer, and, and then at, at that point, I was like, "Wow, oh, she's that's hilarious. She's perfect." So that's everything amazing. that led up to you pulling the trigger, mm-hmm. it had to do with all your years of fighting people, yeah, seeing okay. all those things. Oh yeah, and then you know when you're when you're in law enforcement and stuff, like even going to work. You're getting in the mindset. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, at least for me, like I was getting the mindset, I'm going to war today. There is a chance I am going to die. So I'm already heightened up mm-hmm. and everything. So staying in that constant state of alertness, it wears you down and everything. And then, you know, I, like I've been making videos and putting them on Instagram and Facebook about this, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there. And it's one of those things like, uh, like I talked about in one of the videos, is like when you do see something bad or something bad happens to you and stuff like that, you're required to, okay, yeah, that sucks. Go take your next call. Mm-hmm. They don't want to, you know, you don't get the whole, you know, hey, I need my 30 minute time out to digest this. Exactly. You know, all right, you know, it's, like I said, rub some dirt on it. Yeah. And move them, move them about. Mm-hmm. So you, you don't really realize, like, you understand all the physical energy injuries you get throughout your career, mm-hmm. but no one really understands the mental injuries until it's too late. And when I pulled that trigger, it was too late. But I mean, luckily, the, it but didn't it, go off. But it wasn't too late. Yeah. And now I'm here. Yes. You know, able to actually tell my story and hopefully reach somebody that won't be like, I'm going through this alone. Because mm-hmm. I felt like I was going through it alone. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and I know like, you have reached. You reached out to me whenever I was going through some stuff. I had other officers reach out to me, but it's one of those things. Like, you know, I really appreciated it and everything, but I don't want anyone to know. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. when people are going through that stuff, especially law enforcement guys, you're not going to really know how bad it is. And they're really good at hiding it. Because, like I said, I didn't want to lose my job. If I told, if I went to work and said, "Hey, I'm having issues." I'm having thoughts of suicide and stuff like that. They're like, oh, man, that sucks. Well, you can't be on the street. Give me your badge. Exactly. Then I just lost the way to provide. Yeah. And it, yeah. I mean, just something that you said earlier, I held that in my head. I was like, don't <laughs> let go of this thought. You said something about the experience that you experienced at the car wash, about you almost taking out your gun and all that. You I'm speak for you for just a minute and by mm-hmm. I mean, correct me chime in you are alone in this moment because you don't feel like you can trust your peers enough to tell them that you're vulnerable all of the interactions that you have with general public have been negative you're the only person on this island exactly yeah who do you turn to you you don't have anyone you turn to yourself yeah you turn to the guy and whenever yeah and you're not there for yourself 
you drink, and then whenever that stops working, you're done. You see that gun laying mm-hmm. there, mm-hmm. you know, or whatever aspect it is that you want to end it. You're right. Maybe it's just a shitload more beer with some pills. Mm-hmm. You know, so yeah, absolutely, you're completely alone, and that's the bad thing with majority law enforcement officers. Like what people don't understand is when they encounter people they're encountering people at their lowest point. Mm-hmm. So they're mm-hmm. seeing the worst of humanity at Literally. least 80% of their career. Literally. So obviously they're just going to, when you're out and about, not on duty, you're already going to have a distrust for people because it's been ingrained in you. Yep. And I remember one of your podcasts you were talking about where uh, you're on one of your side jobs and a guy walks in, you're like, oh, this guy's a thug. Yeah. And he came and prayed for you mm-hmm. and stuff. You know, you know his name. I can't remember to save my life. Oh, Josh. Yeah, yeah. Shout out to Josh. Not that he listens, but he will maybe one day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Like, if I would have saw him, like you kind of described him, like, yeah, I probably would kept my eye on him and all that, and probably been real skeptical whenever he started walking close to me. Like, I probably would would put my hand on my gun or something like that, just from all my interactions I've had mm-hmm. and everything, and then be shocked as hell that mm-hmm. you know he gives me a hug and starts praying for me. Yep. So, but you know, man, some of those moments like that, it's like they're like resets. Yes, because exactly. you're stuck. You you have this mindset where I'm stuck, I'm stuck, I'm stuck because I keep seeing the same shit every day. And then here comes somebody else or something yep. or some type of situation that looks like that shit that you always encounter. Yep. It's like there is some good in this world. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And that's one of the things, man. That like I I try to encourage people and not just officers, but just people in general, try to find good. Because especially, dude, being a cop, bro, like, like, not too long ago the, when the whole George Floyd thing, man, I was feeling like what you were talking, not to the point where I was suicidal, but I felt like I was alone, mm-hmm. you know, and it's very easy to get to that point because it's not like, doesn't mean that I'm like a little bitch or like I'm very sensitive to what other people think, but it's just when all you constantly see is just that negativity and the way people portray you and they don't even fucking know you, it's yeah, going to start exactly. taking a toll on you. Exactly. Anybody. So, man, ch- just find good. There's, it's yeah. out there. Dude, I'm, I'm. you were a cop for how long? Uh, just shy of 10 years. Okay, I'm 10 years, 11 years, December. Mm. I can still say there's some good. Because oh, yeah. the moment we start saying there's no good, then we're going to end up doing lost. what you just, yeah. what mm-hmm. you just, yeah, so. Yeah, well, I tried. Yeah. yeah.